I think the president is stealing our money because of this and you give some reasons. Nothing can happen to you. You cannot bribe a judge in South Africa. This is not a possibility. Colonization in South Africa only actually ended in 1994, yeah. 30 years ago. In order to create direction, you need to be maybe more dictatorial. You know, we didn't yet know about any troubles in Amhara region. You can believe me or not. I was in the army. I was. I did endurance sports. I was a businessman. We had no problems with border crossings until we got to Ethiopia. It's so depressing. Where are you go, Franji? Where are you go? So you've got people walking around. They are drinking araki, and they're carrying AK-47s. Couldn't cross and wait because then the lions will come and get me. And the very next day, we got taken hostage and beaten and everything. E Ethiopia stands out as the most unique country that I went through in, in a number of ways. Some of them good and some of them not so good. I think Ethiopians struggle with trusting foreign people, foreign investors and so on. The man in your Ethiopia, and the million people in the bank, ask about how much is it? dollar to fat. Yeah, I'm going to introduce my daughter to South Africa. Keith Boyd. Yeah, he, he, he completed uh, the fastest journey from Cape Town to Cairo on foot. Beggar, Berucha, South Africa, Cape Town. Or Jogi Yaraga. Ah, Ska Cairo dress. Ska Egypt Cairo dress. Besosmo to Andkan, where Asr Andishim now in kilometer. Arragat. Yeah, because if it has a record, so smooth was rustling. Ah, very long, Lisa in a pair. This time, and South Africa no break at a rego. Now soon, I can run lateral gin. I can run a bit of creat bendino. Bazi journey lay yalla. Yeah, Africa bamulu salam no sakalach. Good little buta alfal, besalam alfal. Even Sudan, Beka, Kaftanga, Africa, or Natalia Betty Barona Garasu, Yerutan Yalafo. Yeah, Piagana are rotten. Allah wrote that. Allah wrote no. Oh, Allah wrote no. Now, as soon as you did a journey, you did a little bit of a journey. I was like, I'm going to go to the city. I'm going to go to the city. It's an amazing journey. I'm going to go to the city. 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 I'm you guys should watch it. Yeah. Can you tell us about what you're doing? Realization. Realization. <laughs> oh, we could also do that, yeah. Uh, it's it's amazing. Like. And then so the motive they have. Yeah, ten us about them. Yeah, ten us about them. Can you? And you can generalize the narrative. Political. Mercha Africa's political internet with a rather loom. Buzzo with Tatoch, I'm her tomb, the Merchal in Massa Felago de Lacho. Merta Tacal? Bavala for Mercha, Merchal. Man, I take and desire to yak my enemies. Not to my talk of any Merchalak in my level, Merskevala phone. Like Bazimiknatno, ah, in the master. Yalmer at Achsa which Carla to comment her, but Achumata. Let me achieve so again. Yalmer at Achsa which reason Carla to reason Achuna. Sensur and Dalmer at Achu. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm twenty eight right now. I undeserved Alfuinal, and the answer were child. Yeah. Yes, who any Joe Miss Roman deno, South Africa with Atuchil, Mercha, and Dimmer to Manasat Muzam Magar, Sunda Locahone, Italia you with Atuch, Merchale Satta from political position which lay him a sat of. But Amik and Nasano, in the Makinat Pulak Arabo de Mumindino, Yalutin Mari Mindino. Power Botale, Wim de Mu, Yseltam Botale, Lusa Wuchin, Emnet Slamayoracho, Metslamasa Drubacho, Bemertam, Lut Amat Ambulus, Lamiasuvo Bulu, Kazam and Nasatno, Rainbow Mindin, Rainbow? Something. Yeah, look it up. What was the company? Wait. Where did you send me Instagram? Instagram. Rainbow runs or something. So I wrote home, but no has our rucho. Yes, in our agenda, Lalem is Africa's villa madras. South Africa, my full, you look African, Benicat, Mercha, and the other go, Mengsacho, and Dimertu. Emerald to Mengsat Ayaki in the other go, Mengstam Halafina to induced. No, as I win a pearl, and yam do where Mikat Trout or Emerge Ayed in Alana Gernan. This is a merch ale kulum so, Fetahi won a menged. You know, Bagulbet sound, Besalamo Menget, 
ድምጹን የሚያሰማበት እንደውም አንድ ኤግዛምፕል እየሰጠው ቦትስዋና ምርጫ ጣቢያውን ከበው ምንም ነገር እንዳይጨረብር ማለት ነው እስከ ማታ አምሽታችሁም ቢሆን ዩኖ ዝም ብሎ መርጦ መሄድ ብቻ አይደለም አገር ነው አላፊነት ነው እንደዛ ማድረግ ካለብንም ዩኖ እንደዚህ እንደዚህ ብቻ ሙሉ ኤፒሶድ ውስጥ ታዩት እኛም በጣም ሞቲቬትድ ስለሆነ ብዙ ብዙ ኦን ታፕ ኦፍ አወር ማይንድስ ብዙ ነገር ስለይመጡ ካሜራ ማን ያልቆረጠችው ፓርት ተሰማላችሁ ሬምቦይ ኤዲተር አልቆረጠሽ ፓርት ሬምቦይ አንር ሰው ኖ ሬምቦ ሊደርሺፕ አላል የሱዌንጁ ሶ አው ቻናሉ ያ ለሱዌኒሼሽን ነው ይሄንን ሩጫ አመሩ ጠፈለገው ሶ አንድ ተከምናሙን አብቆይታናል በዙ ማብራስ ሲጠፋ ሲመጣ ሲጀምራል ነበር ሲንጨልብ ስንበራ ያ you know get to know you okay sure very welcome very welcome so i've already read a lot a lot of stuff about you about your achievements about your uh, angels and the things you were doing i was fascinated by it but i would like you to give us a proper introduction for our audience so that they they would know you know a little bit more about you yeah no worries no worries Um so my name's Keith Boyd I'm 58 years old. Mm-hmm. Um I was in business for many years focused on uh on mainly Africa bringing investments into Africa property and uh, telecommunications. Mm-hmm. And um and now I I finished I stopped working full time um and I now I started a um a non-profit company so i am now what i call a socio economic activist mm-hmm. and i'll explain you know the socio economic part of that um and the organization it's founded on the premise that in south africa nelson mandela told us to build what he called a rainbow nation mm-hmm. and that rainbow nation it's got lots of tribes lots of religions lots of languages you know we have uh, 11 official languages in south africa yeah so we have to be this kind of this rainbow tribe if that makes sense yeah uh, and he called it the rainbow nation and um i was a young man i was younger than you guys are i was 23 when nelson mandela was freed and we were on the road to democracy so i feel i've got some time left maybe inshallah god willing <laughs> i have some time left that i can use to do some good for my not just my fellow countrymen but i think in in the greater african context mm-hmm. because the enemy is poverty yeah. that is the biggest enemy we face on our continent today and so i wanted to find a meaningful way of trying to diminish uh poverty all right that's that's nice to know that's a great inspiration and my next question would be what inspired you to you know at this age i'm not saying you're not capable but <laughs> <laughs> compared to a lot of young people you're kind of old so uh what made you inspired to start this journey yeah i mean so i started rainbow leaders with the view that what we were going to do was we were going to really work hard to get young people to go and vote mm-hmm. that is the aim of rainbowleaders.org.za the south african non-governmental organization the non-profit company its role is to get young people to vote mm-hmm. and why do we think that's important because If you have good leaders, I promise you, I promise you, if you have good leaders like Nelson Mandela, Mahatma Gandhi, there have been a number of really wonderful leaders in the world. Everybody in the country just wants to behave in a better way. Mm. Where you saw differences, you see similarities. Where you saw problems, you start to see solutions. Yeah. Where you were thinking, maybe I'm not going to do the right thing, you realize, no, I must do the right thing because the leaders are doing the right thing. Yeah. And that's where it starts. It starts with young people electing really good leaders. And um right now they're not doing that. They're not even voting. They are they are they are so yeah. annoyed with politicians and politics they 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 don't trust any of them. Um so the problem was we needed a voice. Mm-hmm. And if you want a voice, you need to go and hire somebody famous or you need to do something worthy, something mm-hmm. that is newsworthy. Yeah. And so this was it you know is we had to do something you know ride to the moon on a bicycle or <laughs> do something crazy 
<laughs> you know, climb Everest in our flip flops, you know, in our in our sandals, you know, backwards or something. Yeah. But I thought the, the the greatest thing that I could do would be the most difficult challenge I could find in Africa was to go from Cape Town to Cairo, mm. the traditional route, the length of the whole length of the continent mm. in the fastest time and break the existing world record, which had stood since 1998. How long was so, that? you know, giving us a voice and it's like we are speaking because of this, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you guys are hosting me on your wonderful show, your wonderful podcast because of that, you know? Yeah, yeah. that is true. How, how long was the previous uh, record? It was 318 days. Oh, I see. It was set by an English an English guy called Nicholas Bourne. When was that? 19? 1998. 1998. I was one years old by then. <laughs> yeah. There you go. There you go. So, <laughs> how was the preparation like? Uh, be actually, be before we move to the preparation, I want you to say a little bit more about the voting because mm. uh, I myself don't like to get involved in politics and things like that, and I've never voted in my life here in Ethiopia. And it's kind of fascinating the young people in Africa have similar paths and similar lifestyles. So I want you to say more about it. Awesome. Yeah, very, no, that's a really good point that the problems we have in Africa are very similar. Yes, we speak different languages. We have different religions, different branches of religions, different customs, different traditions, but we face a lot of the similar problems. Mm -hmm. And what, what happens is it's about trust. And what I say to young people is, I say, if you knew a, 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 a bandit, a bad person who lived in your village, and he said to you, look, uh, will you lend me a thousand bir? And tomorrow I will give you 2000 bir. Mm -hmm. You would think very carefully if you're gonna do that, because you realize there's a big risk here. But if your friend came to you and said, look, can you please lend me a thousand bir? And I will give you back 1,100 bir in a week's time. You will lend, if you had the money, you will lend it to your friend, right? Because you yeah. trust your friend, it's your friend, right? But you wouldn't lend the money to the guy you don't trust, even though he promised you something much greater True. than 1,100 bir. He said, I'll give you 2,000 bir and I'll give it to you tomorrow. Mm. So this is, this is what has happened is that Young people don't trust our leaders yeah. because that's the kind of thing they keep doing. They keep taking our money sometimes. They're not spending the hard earned taxes. And you know, if you put fuel in your bajaji, there's tax in that. Yeah. You know, there's tax in fuel. Every single person, no matter how poor they are, if you get into a bajaji, you are contributing to the tax base of the country, yeah. for sure. Because the guy went and got his fuel and inside of your price that he's charging you is the price for that fuel. Um, he had to pay import duties on his bajaji when it came into the country for his taxi. Mm -hmm. There's another form of taxation. And he has to recover that over years through the price of the ticket. So I think what I say to young people is, um, you know, trust is, is the most important ingredient in, in any relationship. If it's in a marriage, if it's in a friendship, if it's an investment relationship, if it's between the, your leaders and yourself, and when you break that trust, that is when people say, I don't want anything to do with you. Yeah. So instead of holding the, the bad guy who ran away with your money, instead of holding him accountable, you just say, I'll oh, just leave him. I, I'm never going to lend anybody money again. And that's a natural human reaction. It's too much trouble to hold people accountable for the things they do wrong. Yeah. And I think the best way we can do that is, the best way young people can do that is, you don't have to be angry. You don't have to shout. You don't have to fight. You don't have to kill anybody. All you have to do is next time there's an election, you vote for somebody that you think you can trust. Mm -hmm. um, and if you don't do that, then we, we're going to end up, if I look at the similarities between South Africa and Ethiopia, um, you know, South Africa will be in the same situation of some of the, the challenges you're facing now, you guys are facing now in your country in 20 years time if we don't, if we don't fix things in South Africa. Yeah, so I think the biggest issue right now is uh, elections are not even uh, trusted in Africa. Most people are not, don't even want to be involved in that things. Uh, yeah, picking your picking your government is actually a very good thing if they're actually gonna be if your vote is actually gonna be counted properly. So how does your company uh, or how does your NGO support you know like a fair election in a way? 
So, so where South Africa is really fortunate, and we as South Africans are really lucky, we have a few things that underpin democracy. Mm. You know, when I was running through Sudan, I asked one of the chaps, one of the guys that was helping me, one of the guides, you know, what, what do you need in Sudan? What's going to make Sudan better? And he told me democracy. We need to be able to vote. Mm. But I said to him, I don't think that is enough. Because of the exact point you make now, Dagam, you, 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 you have put your finger on the problem. Yeah. That in South Africa, we have a few things. We have freedom of the press. If you want to write in the press, in a newspaper, mm. I think the president is stealing our money because of this and you give some reasons. Nothing can happen to you. This is completely legitimate. You as a citizen, you are allowed to speak your mind. You can't say the guy is a liar if you can't be for sure, because then he can, you can be taken on a civil court and you can be sued. But the courts are not controlled by government. In yeah. South Africa, we have an independent judiciary. So for example, if I went to court in South Africa for, for any reason, I will be comfortable that I will receive a fair trial. It's not perfect. It will take longer than I, than I would want. It may take one or two years as opposed to three or six months. But you cannot bribe a judge in South Africa. This is not a possibility. Mm. I think and so, so then it, it is ex indeed very crucial. The separation of state and the judiciary is non-negotiable. Politicians have to be kept in check by the courts, by the laws of the land and the courts. That is the most important um, issue. We then have what we call chapter nine institutions. Mm -hmm. Those are things like the national prosecuting authority, things like the public protector. Now those institutions are led by people who have different roles in keeping politicians honest. So if we think that the government is misspending money, we have the right to go to the public protector and we can complain to the public protector and the public protect protector gets money from the tax base to then take that politician to court. Do, do you get my point? So, you yeah. know, yeah. it's no good just saying, oh, go and vote and let's hope for the best. And then somebody is um, is doctoring the votes, is, is, is falsifying the election results. Mm -hmm. But we do not have that problem in South Africa. This is, this is uh, this I'm, I'm sure of. If there's electoral fraud, it's very, very, very small yeah. in South Africa. So I think one of the key things uh, you guys want to do is actually you know, democracy is not just uh, voting. It's, so it's just, it's a system of, uh, you know, yes. everything, the judges, the uh, executors and everything. So it's all about creating yes. awareness of what it should be like, if I understand correctly. Yeah. All right. Yes, it, it, exactly. And, and Dagam, one thing I would say, it, it's a contentious point, but I know you guys are very intelligent and you, you'll understand I encourage everybody, if you look at the picture behind me, to, to mm -hmm. think in full color. Don't think in black and white. So we are allowed to, as human beings, let's say I disagree with, um, I disagree, what can I say I disagree with? I disagree with smoking marijuana. Let's say I disagree with smoking marijuana. Let's just assume that. Mm -hmm. But I might make the argument that we should still legalize the use of marijuana. Mm -hmm. Now, many people will say, but this can't be possible. If you disagree with the use of marijuana, you should ban it. You should make it illegal. That's what I call binary thinking. Mm. It's black and white. Yeah. I, I think there's a, there's, there's, there's a way of looking at a problem that says, I disagree with the use of marijuana, and I don't want to use marijuana myself. I don't want my adult children using it. However, I think there's a, a, a drug and there's a gangster problem. And I think by legitimizing uh, marijuana, we can control the quality and the, the, and we can tax it and so on. And we can protect people who are getting um, mm. killed in the drugs industry. Yeah. Does that make sense? First of all, it's not the best example, but I hope it makes uh, it clear. It is a good example, yeah. Okay. So sense. now I will go a bit further. Mm -hmm. So when colonizers came to South Africa, if you think about South Africa, it is the most brutally colonized of all countries in Africa. Mm -hmm. You could argue that point, I understand. But remember, colonization in South Africa only actually ended in 1994, yeah. 30 years ago. Because, because although it wasn't Britain running the show then, it was the Afrikaner, it was the South African white population that was running the show yeah. for, 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 for the benefit, for the benefit of white-skinned people, Faranji, not for the benefit of, of, of people who were not Faranji. You understand? Uh, yeah. 
So, so, so what I'm saying to you is that what Britain did, though, in the beginning, they run each of the colonies they 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 went and uh, abused or took over and 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 shot and killed people but what they did they ran it like it was a branch office of britain head office britain does that make sense mm -hmm. and so in doing so they did a lot of things they brought in uh, birth and death registers they brought in uh, legal institutions they understood the importance from their hundreds of years of learning about democracy that you can't leave politicians on their own. You cannot, you cannot let politicians run a country without having them checked and balanced by the press mm -hmm. and by the judiciary. Exactly. And so Britain puts those things in place. The Afrikaners then started to take some of that away. And then they realize when they have to give over power, into a real democracy that does, oh, we need those things again. So they rebuilt them very quickly. <laughs> Do you get my point? Yeah. <laughs> now, I think, I think the thing is that in, 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 in Ethiopia, you, you, you've, your systems, you've had to develop everything from scratch. Yeah. yeah. Because you've never been colonized. The Italians came in and they, they, they hung around for five years and then they, they got chased out. Mm -hmm. And there's no the institutions within ethiopia are not mature enough and robust enough to support a true democratic system does that make any sense to you yeah it, it makes sense it makes sense it's, it's it takes time it's not actually an easy task to do you know whenever you say these things for example having a balancing system for uh, the government is it might be easy to say but you know it's not really even for the english or even for the us which is you know ideal democracies we take for uh, as an example they didn't build it overnight it took it took a long time it took a lot of sacrifice from people and i think we're just yeah. learning through that and people don't really want to give up power that easily yes you're right you're spot on and i think that that is the thing that makes a lot of young people despondent mm. Um, I've heard this, you're not alone in Ethiopia having this challenge. Yeah. Um, and if you look though at some other democracies, if you look at Botswana, mm -hmm. they've now after 60 years of independence, they voted for a new government. This is the first time that a new party has been voted in since the founding father, Seretsi Kama. He was the wow. first president, the founding president of the country. They have been in power since then. But the problem is when you go through Botswana, it's a country with only 2.6 million people and lots of mineral wealth, yet there is still incredible levels of poverty in the north of the country that I saw yeah. when I ran through there. Now, that can only be the result of mismanagement. Yeah. There, is no need, there is no ways they should be poor in Botswana. Everybody in Botswana should have a job and the economy should be supportive of people having a good life. Mm -hmm. And um, so they voted that party out. In Tanzania, it is still today governed by the same party from Julius Nyerere, the founding father, the founding president of Tanzania. 60 odd years later, it is still being run by the same party. You, you see what happens when people get into power, getting them out of power isn't that easy if you yeah. don't have these picks and balances. Mm -hmm. And then what we've seen, what we've seen now, so Botswana has just managed to change that. Tanzania hasn't changed that. Zambia has now changed it. In 2021, it was the young people who went to the polls en masse. And you know what they did? They sat in circles around voting stations to make sure that people couldn't bring in lots of boxes of ballots, extra ballots. Nice. They almost had like a sit-in. And they really, it was a wonderful example of peaceful civic um, cohesion. Um, and yeah, they've ended up with actually a pretty pretty good government in Zambia at the moment. No, oh, that, is, that is a great... Um... I was just thinking that uh, about Rwanda. What's your take on that? On Rwanda? Yeah. You know, because it's a difficult one. And I'll tell, you, I'll tell you why. Because Rwanda, for most intents and purposes, it seems to work. It has an economy that is now better than ever. Yeah. And it is working. Uh, but it's not working under a system of full democracy. I mean, that is painfully clear. No. Um, so in, in Paul Kigama, you might argue you've got a benevolent dictator, meaning you've got a, a dictator who has a good will, who wants the people to do well, who doesn't want to steal all the money, who doesn't want to, uh, you know, to be 
uh, around forever, but realizes that in order to create direction, you need to be maybe more dictatorial. Mm. Now, I'm not, I'm not pro dictatorships. I'll be very clear. I'm not at all pro. But if you look at a place like the United Arab Emirates, mm -hmm. the UAE, so Dubai and Abu Dhabi and, and uh, uh, Ras al Khaimah and so on, those seven emirates that form up the United Arab Emirates, that's also not a democracy. No, nobody votes there. Those guys are sheikhs. They're like kings and princes. They rule the show. Yeah. But they seem to do it in a reasonably benevolent way that benefits most citizens. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'd say that I think chasing democracy for the sake of democracy is, 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 is not my main cause in my life. My main cause in my life is to reduce poverty. Mm -hmm. That is the main cause that I want to spend the rest of my life focusing on. And uh, so I'm not, I'm not defending any de um, autocrats, any dictators. I'm just saying to you that people can benefit if you have a really honest, good leader. You can, you can all move forward together as a, as a nation. Yeah, yeah, you know. I just want to have your two cents because a lot of people have different opinion about it, and I just want you to say your your piece. But moving on, uh, when you realize that you're gonna do this long journey, what was the preparation looks like, and how did you prepare for uh, the journey? So, so I <laughs> I was gonna prepare over six months originally. Okay. Um, and I had to build up my mileage quite slowly. Mm -hmm. My plan was to build up to running 200 kilometers per week. Mm -hmm. Common wisdom, a lot of people said, don't train for more than 100 kilometers a week. But if you think that I was aiming to do 350 kilometers a week, I, it wouldn't have made sense to just do 100 a week until I started. Yeah. So I'm glad I didn't. I had to, I felt I had to, in my last month of full training, I had to do 200 kilometers per week. Um, and I was, I scaled that up over six months, that mileage, the thinking that I know you, you come from a nation of some of the world's best runners. Um, and I think that, you know, it's common wisdom. You should never increase your, your, your mileage by more than 10% per week. So I had a glide slope getting me up to 200 kilometers per week. Then two things happened. One. Um, we realized we were not going to start in Cairo. We were going to start in Cape Town because from a medical point of view and a logistics point of view, it would be much easier to start in Cape Town. And then I would really be able to try out the vehicle support vehicle. I would be able to see if everything worked and if we needed to change everything, anything before we left South Africa, as opposed to coming the other way. If we had some problems with the vehicle or so on, we would have been stuck in Sudan in a war. That's actually so we put, right. We must, yeah, we must start here. You know, we didn't yet know about any troubles in Amhara region. You can believe me or not. Hmm. But I mean, last year, March, April, when we were planning, we didn't know. And remember, the state of emergency was only declared on 4th August last yeah. year, yeah. the first state of emergency. So, um, so we decided we're going to start from Cape Town. Now the problem comes that we have to start at the end of July. We can't start in late September because if we start in late September from Cape Town, we will get into the Sahara in the worst heat of the year mm -hmm. in the Sahara. Yeah. So now we have to start two months early. So now I don't have six months, I've got four months. <laughs> then the second thing that happened to train, the second thing that happened was I got a, um, a heart uh, procedure. I have a cardiac problem with my heart. It's genetic, it's inherited. Mm -hmm. So they had to do a small operation on me but it meant I couldn't run for more than two weeks at all. Uh, and that was only two and a half months before I left, uh, about three months before we started. So really my training was not ideal. And when I got to the start line in Cape Town, I had a right knee injury and a left ankle difficulty. Wow. Um, and I was not at as running fit as I should have been. But you know, you that's how you start a journey. You, are we ever ready for the journey we start in life? How was the mental preparation? You know? Like, I, feel, I understand the physical, but you know, like you have, you just had a surgery. Um, your knees are not okay. How was the mental preparation? How was you feeling? Yeah, I was fine. I mean, I think, I think, um, being fifty-seven at the time, I've had the chance to live a full life. Oh, you know, I've, I've traveled. I've spent most of my life living and working in Africa for of my fifty-seven years, more than fifty of them in Africa, um, and. 
I was in the army. I was, I did endurance sports. I was a businessman, you know, mentally, you know, I don't know how to explain this, but your body becomes weaker as you get older, but your mind becomes stronger. You're, you're emotional because you have so much scar tissue. You know what I mean by scar tissue? Yeah. And, and it, and it's like, it's much easier to deal with difficulty in life when you're older um, because you had so much difficulty. You failed so often. I failed. I've had so many sadnesses and traumas and disappointments in my life that, you know, I wasn't really too concerned about the mental side, if it makes any sense. I see. Mm -hmm. Were there any I was worried about the physical side. The physical side I was really concerned about. But Were you, were you, were you doing any specific trainings just for this? Like, did you have any experience, maybe prior experience of running a marathon or I don't know, running a long Sure, distance? sure. Yeah, I'd done, I'd done marathons and Ironman events. So an Ironman event is where you, you swim 3.8 kilometers, mm -hmm. then you cycle 180 kilometers, and then you run a full marathon. So wow. you do that at one time, one day, finished, that's actually, from start to finish. That's actually one of uh, the things I want to do. You must do it. Yeah. You must do it. It will, but you know, if you train for it, you will be just fine. You know, you will be fine. So I've done a few Ironman events. Uh, and as I say, you know, from my military training and being an instructor in the army as well, I kind of, I, I, I felt um, confident that I know how to get through a really tough time. You know, when I'm really in a lot of pain or I've hit a wall, um, I, I know how to fix it, mm -hmm. whether it's to sit down at the side of the road or whether it's to take some, uh, some bread, Ambasha bread being better, <laughs> above Njera. Ambasha is my very, you know, to have some bread, to have some water, but I know what I've got to do to be able to get up and move again. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I did do some endurance things before this. Awesome. Uh, how was running, running through South Africa? Um, and when you pass the border to the second country, how was the process of, you know, like it, it's not really easy for Africans to travel through Africa, even though we all in the same place. How was the, how was that? Uh, how did you deal with that? Do you know, we had no problems with border crossings until we got to Ethiopia. I wow. promise you uh, from South Africa, we had, we had two vehicles. In fact, we didn't even take the other vehicle into Ethiopia. It was just too complicated. We sent another vehicle back from Nanyuki, which is kind of in the middle of, of Kenya. Mm -hmm. um, but th we didn't have any problems. You drive the vehicle to the border. The, the border people will, if they want to, they will search the vehicle. You know, they're looking for, I don't know, drugs, bombs. I don't know. But, you know, they're experienced. They're kind of working out. Does this guy look like he's on holiday? What's he doing? Mm. And... You have like a, it's called a, you may have heard of it. It's called a carnet de passage. Many people call it a carnet and it's like a passport for a vehicle. Mm -hmm. Each vehicle must have one of these. And what it does is it makes sure that if you take your vehicle into another country, you can't sell it in that country because the automobile association is the big international company uh, that, that does this. You pay them money to, and, and they will, refund the government so if, if if you if you take the vehicle into tanzania for example and you don't take it out the other side mm -hmm. within x number of days 30 days or 60 or 90 days then they send an invoice to the automobile association they say okay one of your vehicles came in under one of your passports the carnet de passage mm -hmm. and it didn't go out so we must make the reasonable assumption somebody sold that vehicle in this country mm. and that way they escape import duties so we're going to send you the invoice and the automobile association has to pay that's how it happens all over okay so it's really easy it's really easy yeah but a lot of people complain you know there are a lot of people who travel from cairo to cape town with a bike by running and with a vehicle but we all hear this problem i don't know what's wrong with our people in our government but a lot of time when they get here they complain a lot about this so there's, 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 there's a couple of problems, I think, in Ethiopia. The, the, the first, let's start at the beginning. To import a vehicle into Ethiopia, it's 200% duty. You, you know that, right? Yeah, yeah. So if a, a vehicle is bought for $2,000, in Ethiopia, it costs $6,000. Yeah. You, you, you know where I'm going. Now, to me, that doesn't make sense to me. This, this is really not a smart form of taxing your people because you already have a constraint of tax. 
Mm. And uh, so what you want to do is you want imports to come in that people can use them for production. Like vehicles, it's for making economy efficient. Mm -hmm. And so on. So you need to have a lot of, you know, to have more than 50% import duty on a vehicle is, is crazy, in my opinion. So that's the first problem, is that people are motivated to smuggle cars into Ethiopia and to try to sell them, yeah. or vehicles. Yeah, yeah. Um, if, if the tax was lower, people wouldn't be that motivated to do that. Um, but the second thing is there's, there's this independence of mind. Can I call it that? In Ethiopia, like if I ask an Ethiopian official, why do you do it this way? It doesn't make sense to me. He says, ah, you don't understand. There is a problem with crime between borders. I said, no, but look, South Africa, Zambia, Botswana, Zimbabwe, Tanzania, T Kenya. We, we, we can't all not understand. And the only people who understand is you, the Ethiopian official. But he claims, yes, he is the only one who understands. It's very complicated. So we have to pay more money. Uh, and you have to get a company in Ethiopia to sponsor your vehicle going into the country yeah. and to take responsibility to take it out the other side. And for that, you will pay a lot of money. You know, it was it cost more money to get the vehicle through Ethiopia than the whole of the rest of the trip. Wow. For the one vehicle. The whole of the rest of the trip. So yeah. the other vehicle return? Yeah, I sent it back from Nanyuki in Kenya. Oh. I, I just we only took the one pickup through through, uh, through Ethiopia. So what happened to the um, crew members that were uh, coming along with you? Yeah. So in the north of Kenya, I had one crew member with me, a Kenyan guy, only the one. He was driving the pickup, um, and he was there for interpretation uh, with the Samburu tribes and the because uh, they speak that a lot of them don't even speak Swahili. And then when I got to the border, I got to Moyali, the border post in the south, in Ethiopia. Uh, um, I couldn't get the vehicle through. They stopped the vehicle in Ethiopia. They said, you need to get this letter. And so for the first time in the trip, I was separated from the vehicle. I had no vehicle, nothing. So I had to grab a big, big tog bag, a big uh, bag with everything in it, my protein supplements, my running shoes, everything I needed for the next two weeks. And I had to jump into a taxi in Moyale, and I got a taxi to the pension in Moyale. Um, and about eight or nine days later, eventually the vehicle, we managed to get it through the border and it caught up with me. I had an Amharic speaking guy with me from Addis Ababa, um, but he didn't speak any Oromifa. Yeah. And that was also a bit of a problem. You know, people got a little bit tense and you understand the dynamics as well better than I do. That if you speak an Amharic in the south, um, sometimes it's fine, it's perfect, and other times the people they just want to be a bit difficult. Um, yeah, you, you understand that. Do I need to expand? I don't think so. No, you don't need to explain that. <laughs> but when when you face these kind of challenges, including I don't know, I saw on Instagram that you had an ankle injury while running. Uh, also, this kind of setbacks during passing a border how, how are you, how are you going to you know how, how are you dealing with these kind of things aren't you like well i think frustrated I, I, th I think i mean maybe i'll go back to an earlier question you asked when i try to answer this you you asked me about how was i emotionally mm -hmm. you know preparing the toughest time for me emotionally was the southern part of uh, ethiopia and the whole trip because i had one guy with me driving the vehicle mm -hmm. and wherever you go there are people and they shout at you Faranji, Faranji, you you it's like it's not you 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 there's nothing polite it's they are really shouting and these can be young boys mm -hmm. and i'm an old guy this is not normal behavior it's it's shocking to me like how can a youngster of 15 years old be shouting at an old man i mean it's just in your society it would be abnormal you agree yeah yeah very, very they don't shout at old people, right? They don't. They don't do that. Yeah, we we'll really respect them. Exactly, but exactly, but the problem it happens is there's no respect for me. Yeah. I, I look different. Therefore, what's important? I have a pale skin. I'm Faranji, and then they don't even care about my age. There's no respect, and that just getting in your face all the time. I got to tell you, mentally, you know, it sounds ridiculous when we're sitting here that I complain about such a thing. But when you're running and you're in real pain all day, 
and you're exhausted and you have these youngsters just getting in your face and these young men shouting at you, shouting at you, and they don't stop. You stop to eat and they're right there and they, yeah. they, they just shout at you. Mm. It's so depressing. Where are you go? Franji, where are you go? And um, it, it, I found it very difficult. I found it enormously difficult, but it's fine. You yeah, know, the, it, the funny thing is... When, they're just not used to yeah, foreigners. They're not used to it. The funny thing is, even when we ride a bike with a full set of kits, helmets, and things like that, they call us, you know, Ferenc or China and things like that. So <laughs> China, China, that's the other one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess a lot of things are new to our society, so that might be the reason. But... Uh, yeah, yeah. I understand what you mean. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting that they call you China or Farangi as well. I like that. I like that. So I wasn't see, I wasn't the only one. Okay. I feel better now. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, how long did it take you to get to Addis? Did you run the whole way through the south? I think the south is actually much safer than the north. Yeah, I ran the whole way through the south. In fact, my sons joined me to run part of the way in the south oh. from about, uh, from about, is it Mojo? Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, from about there, they, they ran with me some of the way. So I, I, my family came out as well, and I spent New Year with them and so on. It was really lovely. You know, um, I went to um, um, Bishoftu Lake. Oh, nice. uh, there's some, some beautiful places down there. But no, I, I didn't. I mean, look, what, what's strange, what you have to realize is really strange, is all the guys with AK-47s. I mean, yeah. this is... this. <laughs> You, you can't have this. You've got people walking around. They're drinking araki and they're carrying AK-47s. <laughs> this is not a good combination, guys. You know? yeah, I that, want you to think about it. It's not something common that you saw through while you're running through other African countries, that like people are not really carrying no. weapons around? No? Never. Absolutely not. No, no. It's highly illegal for anybody other than a, a proper national military person, not or a national policeman, not regional police forces, nobody's allowed to have an automatic assault weapon. What, what about that is Sudan? very, very... What, what, how about in Sudan, when you pass through Sudan? Because we heard on the news there are uh, a lot of war there too. Yeah. So in Sudan, you're quite right. That was different, but that's at war. I mean, we saw young boys, sometimes 12, 13 years old with AK-47s at roadblocks. Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, and you know, you know me, I, I, when I see a guy with an AK-47, I want to see some gray hair. Then I know, okay, it's fine. <laughs> this guy is going to be okay. But when you see, show me somebody who's 12 or 13, or even 17, 18, and he's had some araki, whoo, then you've got to be careful. Yeah, that's really difficult. Yeah. Uh, so you already knew, I think, by the time you reached at this, that, you know, they were issues with the northern part of the country so you still decided to go through yeah so we we had we eventually took four attempts to get through uh dagum mm -hmm. so the first attempt we, we we ran we had no problems actually everybody was really friendly but then uh this guy in a taxi came past we were about 200 150 kilometers north of of Addis. yeah uh, near a cement factory where some Chinese guys had been captured uh, quite recently by Ola. Okay. And, um, or, or I think you call them uh, Sh Shane. What do you call them? The, the, the Sh Shani. Shani, Shani. Yeah. Shani, sorry, I beg your pardon, Shani. And um, so we were there and this taxi stopped and he said to Michael, uh, our local videographer, he said, what the hell is wrong with you guys? Can't this Faranji some, find some other place to exercise? What are you doing here? Are you guys crazy? Get, get out of here, you know? So, so Michael looks a bit worried. He, he tells me, I say, ah, don't worry, Michael. We'll probably be okay. Let's continue. Then about half an hour later, this uh, ENDF vehicle stops. Mm -hmm. And the guy says, look, you, you must now stop. You have to go back to Addis now. Mm -hmm. This is crazy. Can you not see? There is no traffic on the roads here. It's quiet. Go back to Addis now. So we had to drive back to Addis. Damn. And then we, um, fortunately, we, um, we, we had to try and find now how do we get through the rest of Romeo State to the Blue Nile Bridge. Yeah. Okay? Mm -hmm. And what happened was we managed to get the Romeo State Police to agree to escort us. Okay. And they were, they were exceptionally good. They really, I, I can't tell you how helpful they were. Uh, in fact, the commander, when he left us uh, north of, I think it was Goetzion, Goetzion, okay. when he left us, 
We tried to give him just some money to say thank you. Not, not a big money, just some money to say for you. And we just want to say thank you so much. You've done a wonderful job. Appreciation. He said, no, I don't take any money, please. This is my job. I'm happy that you uh, can get through. And uh, if we could take you further beyond the Blue Nile Bridge, we would take you, but we can't. Just a That's wonderful amazing. man. Amazing. No, it was amazing. And it was really lovely, you know. And then, <laughs> so that was... That that was the um, second attempt. The second attempt. Then we then we get through. We get over the Blue Nile Bridge, and the very next day we got taken hostage and beaten and everything. We don't know if it was uh, if it was freedom fighters or bandits. To this day, I I, I don't know. I just know they had AK forty sevens and hand grenades, mm. and um, they they took a thousand dollars off us and they clobbered clobbered me and and our videographer. Oh. Um, and it was at a town called Yetman, Yetman, where you, you branch off. It's just past Dejan. So just north of Dejan, you turn off to the right if you're going up to Bahedar nice. the normal way. Hmm. Oh. So we had to go back to Dejan, and we went back to Dejan and stayed in the pension there. And then we got hold of the South African embassy to say, look, this is what's happened. Hmm. Can you get a military escort for us to get us through in the north? And uh, it took some time, but eventually they managed to get the ENDF to give us a military escort. Okay. And then we got to a town called um, called Emmanuel. You know Emmanuel? Uh, not really. It's uh, on the route about it's about 220 kilometers south of of Baherdar. Okay. Um, on on the main road up there, not not going via the the Yetman side. And um, and then the army said we can't take you any further. It's too dangerous now. So they yeah. they left us there at the side of the road. And we had to go back to us again. That was very difficult. So you guys yeah. tried four times. Yeah. Then the fourth. Then then what happened? We had to we had to go to we had to drive up to uh, Gondar, fly uh, uh, drive from Gondar to we had to fly up to Gondar, drive from Gondar to Matema border post. Mm. And then I ran through the whole of Sudan, the whole of Egypt, up to Cairo. So you didn't have any problem running through. And then flew back through, to Addis. Through, you didn't have any problem running through Sudan? Nothing? Even though they did uh, open uh, the No, not, not, like, not like Ethiopia. You know, you must remember the, the difference in the wars that you have now. Sudan is a conventional war. Mm. So you have the red guys on the one side and the blue guys on the other side. Mm -hmm. And if you stay on the, the east of the, of the, uh, the front line, you're going to be okay, okay? Mm -hmm. the, the problem, what is happening in Ethiopia now, it's what is called guerrilla warfare. Yeah. It's a counterinsurgency war. The problem is um, when, so, so, so the war is everywhere and nowhere at the same time. You don't know where the war is coming. Today it's here and tomorrow it's somewhere else. Mm. Also, you don't, know who, you don't know who the freedom fighters are. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, the only way to, 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 to win a war like that is through hearts and minds. You cannot win a war like that through the barrel of a gun. It's not possible. So every time you kill off a freedom fighter, Two more, right? and there are the, he has nephews and nieces, yeah. and they all suddenly join up for the cause. The, every time you chop off a head, there is another three heads. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is not a war that you win with guns and with might and with power. This is a war you win by sitting down at a table and trying to find that common ground. No matter how difficult it is, mm. you have to do it. Yeah. There's no so, and I know my, my country, South Africa, we went through guerrilla war for, for 25 years before we found peace. Mm. I hope people realize the truth on the ground, but it's kind of difficult what we are seeing right now. But to take you back to the kidnapping situation what was your communication looks like how did you communicate the, the, uh, of course there is a language barrier between you and the guys who kidnapped you so who are they with you how did they you know how how did you manage to you know to just cut them through with a thousand dollar because here we hear a lot of stories uh, even local people get kidnapped and asked a million bird and things like that yeah yeah they did ask us for a million bird just to be clear he was very clear mm -hmm. so the the main guy who was the leader who hit me with a hand grenade and punched me and kicked me he was the leader he didn't speak any english okay. he had a, a cross tattooed on his neck so he was a very religious christian guy but he, he likes to punch <laughs> all people. i don't know why. go figure the irony. but anyway um the irony thank you um 
but but and then the second in charge was a guy who had a scar on his eye um but he he spoke a little bit of english just a little bit and then i had michael my videographer um who was with me so he was doing a lot of the translating okay um they wanted two things from me they wanted me to phone to get the pickup to come back to the town i had uh, shadley my op medic is another south african guy uh, he looks like an egyptian guy you know he he's a muslim but he looks like an egyptian kind of looking guy he'd gone further ahead in the pickup mm -hmm. and they wanted me to phone him to tell him he must come back i didn't say to them i will not phone because then they may shoot michael yeah. for all i know they, they just to show me they are serious don't play games with us mm. so i didn't refuse but i i knew that i was not going to phone uh, shadley as long as i did not have to phone him I would, so i said to them look i will phone him but help me understand what is your pro how can i help you mm. uh, i'm happy to help you but you must you must make me understand what is your problem what do you want and uh, the second thing they wanted us to do was to go to the forest to go into the bushes now i know if you go 500 meters from the road you will oh. never be found yeah you're, you're kidnapped you finished you're done for yeah and so i i said to michael in english very quickly i said michael we have to slow everything down this is a full blown kidnapping yeah. we're going to disappear now and the next thing my wife is going to get a phone call and uh you know maybe she won't be willing to pay any money to get me out so i will be stuck there <laughs> <laughs> Maybe after after thirty years of marriage, she had enough. You know, I didn't want to find out. So, um, so we 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 managed. Yes, I, I think there's something else playing in the minds of the guys is that they they know these drones, um, and I think they're worried that our government. What I said to them was, I said, if you push too hard, just remember the British government. and the south african government they won't be happy about this at all you're going to do something that you're going to regret it's bad for you it's bad for your family it's bad for your organization if you do this but i leave it to you this was so in their mind they are thinking we can take this guy to try to get 1 million bir mm -hmm. but maybe there's some drones coming down maybe they send some british uh, helicopters in they don't know you know these these are country people they're not they don't they're not that yeah. educated they don't have lots of stuff going on so i want to in a way make them a little bit fearful if you understand what i'm saying yeah. um and so they kind of probably did the maths that look if they could get about $1000 now and and get me out of there that was better than trying to get more money and there was a much heightened risk profile if that makes sense no that you makes, that adds up that adds up yeah so so anyway as as it happened shadley didn't even know we were in trouble uh, myself and michael had been had been taken hostage um so he just arrived back with a pickup and so when here i was really surprised to see him i said did you press press the sos button we have a special satellite device uh, like a navigation equipment on garmin did you press the button he said no i didn't know you were in trouble wow <laughs> so wow. i just said okay let me let me do something so i quickly got the money from where i had hidden the money in the vehicle and i count out bom 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 i count out the money in front of the the leader I put my hand out to shake his hand and he he gave me a shoulder bump you know like we are all friends <laughs> that's amazing i think you handled it well yeah, uh, maybe yeah uh, having previous uh, military experience did that somehow help you uh, you know like keep your calm yeah i'm sure i'm sure and i think also i felt you know when you're in a situation michael is is half my age mm -hmm. i felt responsible he is younger than my oldest son he's the same age as my oldest son mm -hmm. so you know you feel almost like a fatherly responsibility So I knew that I just had to try to maintain a level of um cuz cuz the problem happens when you are taken hostage they have all the power you have no power exactly and you have to close this power distance gap it's called you have to try to narrow it hmm. because you can't form a relationship when you have a this gap yeah you have like a king and you have a slave over here you know yeah. and the way you do that is you ask questions first then you start to make requests and then you start to make demands and so the first thing i started this was the questions what do you want how can i help you they said they want weapons they want money for food and weapons and da 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 and you know all of that stuff so look we 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 got lucky i i tell you when we got away um i i said to michael and shadley we really got lucky today you know that's very true yeah that's interesting but when you try to you know plan out your passes and routes 
did you have any any sort of you know challenges maybe missing turns maybe missing navigations and you know you have to go back and do it again did you had any sort of this kind of issues um in in terms of taking a wrong turn in terms of nav navigating to the wrong place yeah yeah um no we had so we had google maps where we had internet mm -hmm. and we had the gps system the garmin system with very detailed maps on so we we really had some decent equipment okay. uh, so i knew we weren't going to get lost mm -hmm. we did have a couple of times we would get to a river i was in zimbabwe in a in a in a wild park where there are lions and elephants and buffalo and um i got to a river and i could cross by foot but the vehicle could not get across. Hmm. So the problem was, I, for example, there, I couldn't cross and wait because then the lions will come and get me. So, so, so what I decided to do was I just had to go back to the previous fork in the road and take a long tour around to another place where the vehicle could cross the river. Hmm. Um, so there were small mishaps like that along the way. Um, once in South Africa, I wasn't looking at, the GPS device, I took a wrong turn. I went 11 kilometers. I turned to the right as opposed to going straight. I was pissed off as all hell um, because, you know, you think, ah, it's 11,000 kilometers. What does 11 kilometers matter? But it matters a lot when you're sore and you're done. Yeah. Yeah. How, how did the, how did you get registered or how, how does the tracking works in terms of registering it into a Guinness World Book Record? So my watch over here was the main tracking device in terms of so this watch, it's, it's like any activity watch. I'm not pushing any brands or anything. I'm not sponsored by any watchmakers. Mm -hmm. So this watch will record your heartbeat 24 by seven. It's recording your heart rate. It'll be recording your oxygen saturation, how many steps you take in a day, because it's got an accelerometer. So if you mm -hmm. shake it, it's like taking one step, one step. And then your speed, it's got satellite. So yeah. when you switch it on to track an activity, it will, it will really, every five seconds, it's, giving a G, it's getting a GPS location update. That all gets strung together, and at the end of your run, you know the speed, you know your heart rate, you know how many calories you expended, etc. Mm. So this is the primary device on which everything is stored. It then connects to my phone via Bluetooth, and it gets uploaded to the website of the manufacturer of the watch. Yeah. And that stores all the, what they call the KMZ files, all the GPS locations. Mm. So this is, I think, the most important thing. The second thing, we had to have 10 minutes of video every day. So even if I, it was taken on your phone, I could take a video of myself talking to the phone and then I just show the surrounding area. You know, here's this shop and here is a, a you know, you get at the side of the road in yeah. Ethiopia, you get those kilometer markers mm -hmm. every one or two kilometers. You can look at one of those. So they wanted 10 minutes of video every day and they wanted a witness book signed every day. So those were the three things we had to give them. So what's a witness so that book? They were, uh, a, a witness book. So basically, we find somebody who we can communicate with, okay, so and they put their name, their telephone number, if they have an email, where we are, and they sign it, you know, with the date. So is it like a predefined things, or did you actually ask uh, Guinness World Book to have the standards out for you guys, or did they make the standards for you? Yeah, we asked them before we started. We said, look, we want to attempt, um, I want to attempt to break the, 20, the, the 1998 world record. Um, what do they need as evidence and proof? Um, and, you know, as I say, technology is, is so much better than 1998. Yeah. yeah. You know, in 1998, I, I don't even, to be honest with you, I don't even know how Guinness verified things in 1998. <laughs> I, I, I have no idea. But now, you, you can't, this thing, this thing, I mean, if you wanted to, you could probably give this watch to somebody else and tell them, go and run there. Yeah. But then you will have a heart rate variance that it, they will see it as a different human being oh. because you have a different you have a different profile of your heart rate at different speeds. And, in, you know, you'd probably be able to detect. I'm, I'm very confident that that the manufacturer for sure, if they were asked, could detect that. No, this has gone on to a person who is fitter than you or not as fit as you mm. um, and so on, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's it. It was a process getting all the videos and the witness book and everything. You know, yeah, it was so a process. How was the last uh, country, Egypt? How did you? How would you define? Uh, how, how was the feeling? Like actually accomplishing and going through all those countries and you know reaching the final destination. Damn. So, so the interesting thing was. Um, sorry, guys. I see you. Your power's <laughs> gone off again. I'm sorry. Again. <laughs> 
Um, oh, it's back. It's there, back. You there you go. Back. It's back. Um, so, so as things actually worked out, I got to Cairo, but I still had to go back to Emmanuel yeah. to run the last 550 kilometer section in Ethiopia. Mm-hmm. So even when I got to Cairo and we had the South African embassy people waiting for us, we had, you know, my sister and my family, my children, everybody waiting for me at Cairo Tower. Yeah. It was like a small celebration because the problem was we didn't think, we didn't think, we didn't know for sure we were going to be able to break the world record. So within a couple of days of getting to Cairo, I flew back to Addis Ababa. Oh. And then I, 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 I communicated with the Ethiopian government uh, through some ministers. I spoke with some people at ENDF. I spoke with the South African embassy. But after almost three weeks, nothing. They just basically ignored us. They, they spoke to us, but they said, yes, we come back to you. But nobody came back to me. Mm. So then I decided that I just had to go for it alone. I, I wasn't going to be able to get any assistance from the government. And to be fair, the war was so um, difficult at that stage that I think if I had gone with ENDF soldiers, really? it would have made me a target as well. Yeah. Um, so I felt better. And so I got hold of um, a, a local tour operator in Ethiopia, um, a young guy. Um, who's done some work with a travel company I, I've got shares in. Um, and we agreed a plan where we would get two minibus taxis with two taxi drivers. Mm-hmm. And remember, when you're traveling in those areas, a person who lives south of, of Baherdar is the person you need in your team when you are south of Baherdar. Yeah. But from Baherdar to Gondar, you need another person. And from Gondar to Matema border post, you need other people who know exactly that stretch of road. They know the people who live there because they go up and down. So you can't take somebody from Addis Ababa and tell them to take me up through Bahedar and Gondar. We, we won't get far, I, I promise you. Yeah. And so that is what we did. We, we had uh, two taxis, two minibus taxis. We had two drivers, two driver's assistants. Mm-hmm. And these guys were fantastic. They are heroes. I'm telling you, I have so much time and respect for these guys. And I still communicate with them today. You know, we had no weapons with us. The only weapons we had was the ability to deal with people, the ability to communicate. Mm. Uh, it still was very difficult. We had the team was locked up overnight no without charge. No doubt. Um, we had uh, w- one of our tour guides was punched in the face by a soldier. He didn't do anything. I was right there uh, for no reason. Um, we had we got caught in an ambush. A uh, firefight between Fanu and ENDF. Uh, we got caught, and I was lying in a ditch, and I recorded on my phone all the shooting and soldiers running around. It was it was quite hectic, um, and I know that I know that that is not welcomed by the government. I know that nobody's supposed to be recording this type of stuff up there. I imagine. Yeah. But I'm not a journalist. I was just lying in a ditch while people were shooting around us, and so I got my phone out and filmed some of it. But it was it was a tough journey. It was a tough journey. Yeah. Mm. You mentioned your children joined you for part of the journey. What did their presence mean to you? Yeah, I mean, I mean everything. You know, you know, when you're a child, you want your parents to be proud of you. Yeah. But when you are a father, <laughs> when you're a father, you want your children to be proud of you. You know, and I think this is what I say to people, to politicians, to business leaders. When I speak to them, I say, remember one thing: if you behave in an incorrect way. Your children will behave in an incorrect way. Mm. They will know you better than you even imagine they know you. You, you can, if you're making money on a dishonest way, don't think your children won't work it out. Unless they are stupid, if they are smart kids, by the age of 30, they will understand completely. The problem they will then have is they think, well, everybody is like that. And they also make some bad choices. Yeah. Mm. And at some point, they're going to end up in a jail or they're going to end up getting murdered. If you, if you want your children to behave in a way that is to live a good life, they don't have to be the richest person in the world, but to live a successful life where they add value and, and so on. That is what I want for my children. And I think it was important for me to make a statement to my children that they will talk about to their own grandchildren long after I'm dead. And they will speak of me and say, you know, we come from a family where this is really important that we do the right thing, even when it's very difficult. Yeah. We, we we have to do the right thing. And so that uh, is, for me, I'm an elder in the, the human tribe. And uh, 
I like to influence young people in, in a positive way by doing things like that. I bet they're motivated to break your record too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe. Who knows? <laughs> you know? Who knows? And, you know, for me, as an example, as an elder in the tribe, the human tribe, I will support anybody who wants to break my record. Anybody. For sure. I, I will give advice for free because I, I, the record doesn't belong with an old man like me. The record, the world record belongs with a younger person or maybe 35 to 40 years old mm -hmm. who's, um, you know, who's going to do a much better job than I did. And that time will come. I hope I can support somebody to break that record. What was the, I read somewhere that you were consuming a lot of food, a lot of calories. And what was your, uh, mm. you know, your menu for the journey looks like? Well, in, 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 in Ethiopia, I mean, I, I like injera, and it's actually yeah, great for my gut. <laughs> ambasha is my best. I'm telling you, if I saw Ambasha, I was there. Ambasha and Buna, I'm happy. I'm sorted. But to get started for the day, I'm a happy guy. You know, I just need coffee and, and good bread and um, beef tips as well. A lot of protein. You have to try and get some meat, some protein, yeah. uh, a lot of beans and lentils. Um, so food was not, I didn't get sick once. I never, got, I, I, only in Sudan for five days, I got really, really sick, but that was the water. I drank water. I shouldn't have drunk. And it's a, it's a long, I made a mistake. Mm. I, I thought it was bottled water, but it wasn't. And I drank a whole lot and then I was really, really sick the next day for five days. Yeah. Yeah. So like as a country, Ethiopia, that's what I understand from your story is it's at the end of the day, it's all about communication. It's all about the way you handle you treat each other so as a country we we like to um what's the right word we, we pretend like we are you know like we like guests we are very welcoming people mm -hmm. and we're very uh like we, we're very commun communal uh, society but you know it that did, that didn't really reflect into your story and that also reflects in the types of businesses that are actually expanding in the country. In the countryside, how, how many businesses did you actually see running around? Or like all the lands that we have, all the resources that we have. So while you're traveling through the rest of Africa, you've probably seen many, many uh, investments and uh, factories being built. But how was, the, uh, how was that in Ethiopia? Did you have the same experience here when it comes to the, you know, uh, in industries? And yeah, I mean, I mean... Ethiopia stands out as the most unique country that I went through in, in a number of ways. Some of them good and some of them not so good. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing that is striking is there are no big investments in terms of retail and so on. So you, you know, if you're in a place like South Africa or Botswana or any country, pick any country, you will have these international chain stores that are selling food and uh, vegetables and canned food and clothes and everything, these general stores like uh, south africa has pick and pay britain has tesco so america has walmart france has carrefour you know th there's hundreds of these there's not a single one invested in ethiopia now the reason is and i know because remember i'm not a runner i'm a business investor mm -hmm. i'm an entrepreneur originally and i never invested in ethiopia and and my job was to bring money in to invest in africa and one of the countries that i chose not to invest in was ethiopia now it, it was a difficult decision to make because there's more than a hundred million people in Ethiopia. Second so that is, populous. okay, sorry. So, so I think that, um, uh, let me go back a little bit. You know, my job was to bring investment into to Africa. Yeah. And one of the countries that really looks great to invest in when you look at the population size is Ethiopia, hmm. more than a hundred million people you want to invest. It's like it. So one of the countries we invested $1.3 billion in 1.3 billion US dollars was in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And I was leading that investment to that country. Um, the reason investors don't invest as much in Ethiopia is because of all the red tape. There's a, there's, there seems to me, if, if I might say, and I want to say this in a constructive way, because I want to see a stronger Ethiopia with happier, more successful Ethiopians. This is what I want to see. Um, and so if I say something that, sounds as if that I'm not trying to get to that point. Um, forgive me, you, I've explained myself badly. But I would say there is, it appears to me, um, a problem in Ethiopia that Ethiopians want to do things the Ethiopian way. 
And it really is quite marked. So there's nothing wrong with being patriotic. Nothing wrong with that. The only problem, patriotism gives you pride on some good things, but pride on some bad things. And pride stops us learning. Pride is the thing that closes our minds. When we think our way is the best way, immediately we have stopped learning. Yeah. yeah. And I think in Ethiopia, there's, there's something in the national psyche that I think Ethiopians need to question about, should you be more trusting of foreigners? And I think, I think it's a trust issue. I think Ethiopians struggle with trusting foreign people, foreign investors and so on. Very much. Um, you know, and they almost feel as if, if a foreign investor comes to Ethiopia, they must want to take advantage of us. Mm. And I can tell you that, of course, when people invest, they want to see their investment grow in value. Yeah. But um, it's not done. It should be done in a way that is what I call symbiotic. And it's easy to do. Um, but the first thing is, you know, you need to break down those barriers of distrust. You know that distrust that I spoke about now of foreign people? There is also intertribal distrust. If you look at the Romeo people, if you look at the Amharan people, you look at the Grand people, you look at the other groupings, there is distrust there. Yeah. And you can argue that that is, some of that is, is valid. I, I accept that. I accept there are, there are bad people in every walk of life in every tribe you will ever find, in every group of people, if it's a church, if it's a religious organization, if it's a government, if it's a, you will find good people and you will find some bad people. Mm -hmm. But we need to understand that there is no whole tribe, whole group that is bad. And uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm sad for Ethiopia. I'm, I'm, it left me feeling really sad and because uh, I see the enormous potential and I've been coming to Ethiopia since since 2000. I, it was the first time I came to Ethiopia mm. uh, to Addis Ababa. And uh, there has not been enough progress. There has not been enough progress for the poor people that I saw. It's kind of sad. It is sad, but you know, you know, the, the first thing to fixing a problem is for us to, to have an honest conversation with ourselves. Yeah. It's easy. As human beings, we are specialists at blaming somebody else for our problem. And we are specialists. It's, it's like something we can do so easily. And, and I, think, um, I think there needs to be more, yeah. Yeah. more even, honesty with our soul. Yeah, even, these even, even with the war as a country whose main foreign currency is from tourism, that we should be able to get a lot of tourists you know, through the country because we have a diverse culture and a lot of things to visit and you know, experience. But... When I hear when tourists came here and experienced this kind of things, it makes me really sad mm. that we're missing out on a lot of opportunities. But mm. you know, you know what I what I don't understand, if I might say, and and um, guys, I understand that you may need to walk a politically correct line. I don't have to. Um, I would say I'm puzzled by the government's approach on a, on a number of fronts. I'm puzzled as to when grievances were raised with the government um, about um, some of the issues against Amharan people in Oromia State, why they were not addressed properly. I'm puzzled by that, number one. Number two, I'm puzzled by the fact that the government thinks that they can win a war, not a battle, a war hmm. through the barrel of a gun. You you can win a battle, but you can not win the war because yeah. you can you can stop everybody fighting now because you crush them. But 10, 20 years down the road, you're going to deal with the, the pushback. You're going to, you're going to deal with the problem 10 or 20 years time. So you can't win a war through the barrel of a gun. You have to win another way. And the third thing that puzzles me is why do they not let journalists go to the North? Because journalism and journalists, they tell a story. You will have journalists from every side telling the story in a different way. But let people decide what version of the story they want to view, they want to see. Mm. And I, I don't know. I think it's completely wrong. And this is the instinct of, of arrogance, I think, um, that makes people put these uh, tough measures in place. I, I really think they should be allowing journalists to go up into the north to tell the story. Um, if they've got nothing to hide, why wouldn't they do that? <laughs> You've said things that we couldn't. Thank you. 
the reality is that we just we just came out from another war from the Tigrayan people. Yeah. And we just you know <laughs> stepped into another war. Another war. I don't yeah. know why they decided to do it's that, but you know. <coughs> so anyway, it's it's tragic. It it really is tragic, and I I'm so looking forward to getting back to Ethiopia in in better times. Yeah. Um, and I really want to come and see Ethiopia at its best. You know, I didn't see Ethiopia at its best this time. Um, and I, I can tell you the guys that have traveled with me, I will go back to Ethiopia. I will visit each one of them. Um, and, um, they are still so positive. You know, they are such, um, uh, they, they obviously are worried and concerned and a lot of them work in the tourism industry. They're directly impacted by the lack of tourism. Yeah. And, um, but I, I will be back and hopefully it will be better days. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. We'll, I hope when you come back, it will be a better time and we'll have the same conversation, but, you know, Maybe in a different can. angle. <laughs> yes, yes. I'd love to. Yeah. Do you have any more questions? No, I don't. Do you have any more things that you actually want to add? Uh, thank you for your time. Yeah, I just want to say that I, that to all Ethiopians, you know, the, the issue is um, we can focus on differences and we can focus on the past. Yeah. But um, focusing on the past is about as sensible as trying to drive a car down the road by looking in the rear view mirror. You can't make progress and you're going to crash. Yeah. You need to really forget about the rear view mirrors and look out the front windscreen. And that's the only way you can make fast and rapid progress. Mm. So just, you know, take a leap of faith. Trust the people that you saw as adversaries and be brave. Finding peace takes a lot more guts, backbone and determination and fighting another battle it does it does it does all right all right thank you very much thank you for your time we had an, a wonderful conversation and uh, i guess we hope to see you again yeah fantastic i'm a second alu galatoma thank you ciao. i appreciate it <laughs> hey ciao, ciao ciao bye guys ciao.